All right, so we have our full grain here, but we do have the dura right here. It's kind of peeling up a bit. You can kind of see a slice that was taken out of it. And so this right here, this thing I'm trying to pull up is a very intact dura. Now to try to get through it, you can take the dull knife to just try to cut off things in pieces. I don't recommend trying to pull it off entirely because it holds onto the brain very well. So we're just gonna pull it away from the brain and just sort of slice through it in parts. So we expose the brain underneath. The black lines are blood vessels for people that are curious about that. I'm gonna just sort of liberate it from the front a bit and then also a little bit more on this side. Okay. And we continue to unwrap this lovely present. <laughs> yep. A really sad Christmas. <laughs> oh, we're going to have such a morose sense of humor for this lab, I can tell. It's going to go there. Um, all right. So as we peel it back, uh, it's going to get a bit tricky. So I'm going to continue to slice up and outward. You want to make sure not to poke your hand or anything like that. Um, but as you're peeling it back, you want to make sure to peel it back from between the two hemispheres as well, cutting carefully. It is tough. You can actually hear me tearing through it. Uh, and once we get to where the cerebellum is, that's where things get tricky because it's actually rooted in between the hemispheres and the cerebellum. There's this like gap. You can almost see it on this one. Let me just pull this over here. There's this, uh, three different kind of bulges of the brain. We got the back of the cerebral hemispheres and the bulge of the cerebellum. The dura mater takes a really big chunk of itself and winds its way deep in there. So that's what you have to be careful about because if you just pull it out, you're gonna rip apart the inner parts of the brain. So we don't wanna do that. We have to carefully kind of cut and excise it. And so in doing this, um, I'm gonna continue to be careful about that. But we could see how over here now, I'm peeling out a very thick part there take the more dull knife. Okay, peel that back some more. We can cut through the back a little bit to liberate it from the more basal parts. And so now we have another piece that's deep inside between the cerebral hemispheres and the cerebellum. I could kind of pull it up, but I have to definitely still cut through it here. It's going to be a bit tricky, so I will try my best. Okay. Sharper knife time. Okay. If you happen to cut into the cerebellum a little bit, it's not the worst thing in the world. Do try to avoid it to the best of your ability, though. Okay, go from the back a bit. And get in there a little bit more. Okay, I think I've split it up a little bit and now it should be able to be separated. I know, I know. Yeah, so it's still down in there. Gonna have to pull up a piece and then try to excise it, it looks like. Ooh, all right. Let's pull this part back then. Oh my God, it's like a pomegranate. <laughs> <laughs> Not the first thing I thought of, admittedly, but you know what? It probably takes about as much work. It's true. Okay. Just gonna carefully cut that. You can kind of just rest the scalpel blade and bring whatever you're trying to cut through up to it rather than forcing it down. And so I recommend doing that. And now I can just peel around and out to remove this. There is one extra little catch. We wanna be careful about the underside of the brain. Now, in the pictures, what you're going to see is that there will be some other structures that are going to come up with the dura. They're going to come off. Certain things that might come off include the optic nerves, 
possibly the optic chiasm. We'll get to those distinctions of which one's which. The pituitary is definitely going to come off. That's the bulge that's at the, the lowest part of the brain shown here. Other things I think should stay on, but for now I'm going to carefully try to peel this back and remove it. There may be some cranial nerves sticking through, uh, like I suspect. Yes, I will just yank that off carefully. And now we have our revealed brain. If we look at the inside of the dura, you will see sort of membranous tissue here. So, sorry, nervous tissue like axons or fiber bundles. Like for instance, there's a little bit sticking up right here. That is part of one of the many, one of the many cranial nerves. I mentioned briefly in the neuroanatomy lecture segment uh, earlier on in the course that there were a ton of cranial nerves. You didn't have to memorize them. We don't have to worry about most of them in this class either, but I thought I'd point out where they may be. They're a lot easier to see when the dura is on. Once you take it off, you're pulling off the cranial nerves with it. Okay, so that's the dura mater and probably the arachnoid membrane taken off. I mentioned the pia mater. That's going to be even trickier, but one of the tricks to this is that the blood vessels they're not just stuck onto the brain. They are held onto the brain with the pia mater, which is a very translucent thin membrane. So if you find a blood vessel and you just kind of get underneath it and lift it up, you'll kind of see that there is this very, very, very thin membrane that goes all throughout the brain. Now, uh, in the past, when people have read through the packet, they assumed that you had to remove all the pia mater don't ever do that. You'll spend the entire period doing that. Um, we don't need to do that, basically. And if the brain dries out to a, uh, a degree, you will see the wrinkling of this membrane on the outside first before anything happens to the brain itself. But we don't need to take it off. You can try to pull off a small piece if you'd like, um, just to kind of see it in isolation. So I'm going to pick one of the sulci here and then just kind of peel off that membrane tissue. It's like a little wisp of it, basically. Okay, so end clip. We see in this packet. So there will be the mid longitudinal fissure, the division between the hemispheres, the very large crevice there. Uh, there are various other gyri and sulci that I'm not so concerned with. We obviously know about the cerebellum, the large, much more wrinkly mass in the back here. And then we have the brainstem underneath, specifically the part that's sticking out in this diagram, and from our point of view would be the medulla, the lowest part of the brainstem. So that's all well and good, but what we end up caring about is the other stuff that we can see in subsequent pages. So if we view it from the side, we can start to see some other stuff, such as where approximately the lobes might be. And in particular, we'll see a lot more as we reorient the diagram to page seven and look at it from the underside. So I recommend flipping the brain over on its quote back, end quote. <laughs> And as you're looking at this from the underside, what you'll end up seeing are various things. We like to call your attention to where it says optic chiasm. And then if you look on the other side of the diagram, straight across from there, you'll see what looks like II. That's Roman numeral for two. Keep in mind that you're going to see a lot of Roman numerals here. So if you see triple I's, that's three. IV is not IV, it's actually four, things like that. That II designates the cranial nerve number two, which happens to be the optic nerves. So rather than saying optic nerve, which would have been way easier for us, they said optic chiasm, or sorry, they said uh, nerve two. You can see this on your dura mater if you take a look back at it, and the optic nerves are sticking out as per prongs like this. So it kind of make a little bit of a V shape on the outside. The crossover, where it's the bottom of the V, that would be the optic chiasm. 
And then as these same nerve tissues recede into the brain, deep into structures like the thalamus, they're called the optic tract. So it's nerve, chiasm, tract. So if this is cranial nerve two, what do you think cranial nerve one would be? You might get some hints from the picture that their numbering of nerves is based on how far back they appear in the brain. So as you go down, the nerve numbers get larger. So that means that the cranial nerve one would be more forward. Yes? The olfactory ventricle, or olfactory nerve. Olfactory nerve, absolutely. So the olfactory nerve, again, might be attached to the dura. I don't know if it's on my specimen, but it would basically be these sort of uh, lighter colored flaps toward the very front of the brain if you have them intact. So olfactory nerve connects to olfactory bulb. They kind of blend in with each other. And olfactory nerve would be Roman numeral one in this case. There are various other structures we could look at here. For instance, uh, let's see, I think we still have part of, yes, okay. We took off the pituitary, which we removed from the dura. As I mentioned, it's this lump that's on the bottom here. And mind you, it's like a hard lump if you try to feel it. Uh, the pituitary normally covers up this other area that's sort of in the middle. So if you go behind where it says optic chiasm, or more south from there on the paper, you'll see this little thing that says infundibulum. If you look closely at the brain tissue, there'll be this weird little hole pocket right in the middle there. It's gonna be very tiny, but we could point it out basically right in there. And for anybody who happens to take a look, it's basically right about there. Very, very, very tiny. Behind the yep. Yep. So the infundibulum, it's the way through which the pituitary connects to the rest of the brain. There are other nerves that we pulled off. For instance, a lot of you ended up cutting through nerve number three uh, as we were removing the dura mater further back. Beyond that, we have other structures that we could see from the underside. For instance, the pons is actually pretty low down. It is one of these mounds that's toward the base of the brain. So we see pons sticking out here as far as the brainstem. Beyond that, we'll have the medulla. There'll be maybe more cranial nerves attached, maybe not. Um, but these are pretty much like the, the go-to things to look at. There is one other thing, the pyriform lobe, which also appeared on page six when we were looking at it from the side. It's sometimes called parahippocampal cortex. Um, and this pyriform lobe is something that we actually saw in the rat lab as well. So in the most anterior parts of the brain, when we were looking at the nissel stains and you saw how there was this dark purple squiggly line in the bottom left and bottom right of the brain. And if you don't remember right off the top of your head, that's fine, you can go back and look later. But there was a pyriform cortex area that did this weird sort of swish mark. And so now we're looking at the outside of that pyriform cortex when we look at these bulges off to the side of where the olfactory, sorry, of, well, off to the side of where the optic chiasm is or was. Alrighty. So that's my demonstration first of the um, underside and side views of the brain. So we can end clip. When we are trying to make this cut, you'll want to do it with one of the larger blades, so either the box cutter or the knife I've provided. And instead of sawing, you want to actually try to just press it all the way down and then drag the blade all the way through. So you'll aim from the front. I'm just gonna feel free to come closer if you need to. I'm gonna aim between the hemispheres right here at the front. And then I will just kind of drag this backward through the entirety of the brain. You can grab different parts as you cut. And slice it all the way down through the brainstem. Pop! <gasps> opened up. And 
that's a cut, so we'll end that clip there. Mid-sagittal, because we just divided the hemispheres equally, right in the middle. So taking a closer look at this, we have a lot of stuff that we could look at. Uh, towards the middle-ish part, you should see a relatively circular shape that's a little bit darker gray color. And that is what the IM refers to in the diagram on page 9. You can use that diagram to help ground you onto where you're trying to look here. So the IM is that larger uh, sort of grayish type area. You may or may not be able to see the cross section of the optic chiasm. It depends whether it pulled off or not. It normally, in this case, should be here. Um, we also have, uh, let's see, since I'm going to be just illustrating things for the, the video, I'm just going to point to things that it doesn't matter if I'm saying anything. So, okay, corpus callosum. We've got, um, what else here? Uh, hypothalamus, mammillary body. We've got the pineal body. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's for you, Clara. <laughs> this is the best time for my toes to start itching on when, when you have that, the other ones don't in the ears. Uh, so then we've got superior colliculus here, inferior colliculus. We have a cerebral aqueduct here, and then fourth ventricle here. And then we have these arbor vitae going throughout all of here. You can see from the cross section, we have the pons here. Um, what else do we have? Oh yeah, the septum pellucidum. Pellucidum. <laughs> that would be about here, but I think in this case it is already opened up. Mind if I try out yours again? Yes, sir. All right. Yes, for this one, actually based on how the cut is, it's definitely off. Um, not your fault at all. <laughs> that oh, no. one little thing. We've got that here. Ooh, it went back in. <laughs> I think that's about it for this clip. Okay. So. The septum pellucidum intact in one of the brain preps. So uh, people might want to come in and take a close look at this. All right. So it is located basically right here. It looks like a continuation of the corpus callosum, which I guess technically it is. But if we poke into it and pull it up, we can actually expose what is hidden inside. So, yep, all sorts of treasures today. <laughs> Merry Christmas. A Merry Christmas to all. Uh, this audio will not be used. That's right, edit and post. Um, and then, when we open it up, we have exposed the inside of this part of the brain, which includes the lateral ventricle. LV, in rat brain terms, we saw that a decent amount. And next to the LV, the darker bulge that most of you have visible already in your preps is the caudate nucleus, or mm -hmm. CPU, in the rat brain atlas. So, the caudate nucleus is a little bit more exposed there. Now, knowing where these things are is helpful for when we actually extract and remove the entire hippocampus in a little while. So we will be doing that in a short bit. Okay. And if there's pia mater kind of binding the cerebellum down a bit, you can cut through that just a touch to remove it as need be. But basically, as you pull up on the cerebellum and you look between the brainstem and the cerebellum, you will see that there are fiber tracks that are kind of keeping it adhering on here. It doesn't just pop off. You can also try going in from the outside and looking at the same thing. 
Now, one way that you could go about this is that since we have a sagittal section, we can put flat side down and it stays put. Uh, stay put. Uh, and so we can cut into the cerebellum at a 45 degree angle, into the cerebellum, not toward the brainstem. So I'm cutting this direction here, and I'm aiming it at the cerebellum, sort of at the base of it, and I'm cutting outward this direction. So now, that should remove most of the cerebellum. We still have cerebellum attached, but this is gonna be easier for us to work with. So now when I flip it over, I can kind of flip it around and see where I can extract more stuff. Take this chunk out of the way here, look at it from the back a little bit, and I'm going to continue to cut into the cerebellum again, this time with a more vertical slice, just to remove this part here. And now I think if I pull back the chunk of the cerebellum underneath, we can start to expose the brainstem. So take off that chunk. We can cut just a slight bit of that off. Carefully, very carefully. Okay. That's good enough for me. Alrighty. So now we've exposed the dorsal surface of the brainstem. In this case, it's half of it. So if you would like to coordinate with one of you, the other tables around here to, with your powers combined, form a full brain again, um, you will be able to see the viewpoint that you end up seeing on page 13 here. Right? <laughs> There are a lot of structures to look at, and what I'd like you to do is try to find as many structures as you can in this list. Not all of them are gonna be important. I'm gonna ask you about the following ones. I will ask you about superior colliculus and inferior colliculus again. I will ask you about the fourth ventricle. And I will ask you about the gracile and cunate nuclei. And then, because we just cut through it, the cerebellar peduncle. And that's about it. So now I'm just going to illustrate these, just to like point at them for posterity in the video. I'm going to make a straight vertical cut, cutting off, let's say, the top uh, centimeter brain. I am bad with measurement. Could actually, let me take this knife. <laughs> so first, we, we see the inside of the cerebral cortex, and we can do a quick comparison versus the cerebellum. We see that the cerebellum has a lot more white matter tracts. It's a lot more convoluted, let's say. It has a lot more folds, a lot more divisions. And so this shows that the cerebellum is a much more dense brain mass compared to the cerebral cortex. We take a look at the dorsal view again, making sure I'm not cutting too much. Then we continue, take off like another few millimeters. In this case, I might saw a bit but that's not the worst thing in the world. Okay. So not exposed yet, just another slice. Get out of here. Uh, I'm gonna saw off another millimeter or two. Ah, okay. I've started to expose the top. So first, there's a little indentation of where the lateral ventricle 
first starts, like the dorsal piece of the lateral ventricle. The lateral ventricle is kind of like a triangular shape. So what we're going to end up seeing here is that the lateral ventricle will start opening up here, and this top part is part of the hippocampus that will be peeling out. So we don't want to cut into this any further. Instead, we have to liberate the hippocampus. And so to do so, one thing that I do is to make this process a little easier, I'll take the knife and I'll cut into the brain going this direction to help split it open a little bit. I'll do that again some more. And so now what will happen is we can start to peel this back a bit. The hippocampus is... <laughs> it is this thing, we kind of see this whitish bulge on the inside here. Okay. <laughs> I know. It, well, it's, it's less... <laughs> It's less beige than the rest of the stuff, okay. if you prefer. Um, let's see here. Now, extracting this is never the cleanest thing in the world, so I'm going to try my best to do that. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is we've got to peel off the back of the cerebral cortex. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into here, I'm going to pry it open, and I'm going to just rip this chunk off here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go behind it, into the backbone of the hippocampus, and I'm going to try to follow it down. So as I peel this back, you'll see that the crevice keeps kind of going deeper into there. And so as I just forcefully rip off the back of the cerebral cortex, this starts to expose the backbone of the hippocampus, which is now this larger bulge that we could see here. I then continue to expose it by peeling off the lateral parts of the um, cerebral cortex, so I'll just kind of tear off this chunk here to expose it. I'll then tear off the base parts, the pyriform cortex I mentioned before. We're now going to try to remove that. It also had the name of parahippocampal cortex. Now we understand the relationship because they're right next door to each other. They connect to each other. So we start peeling this back a little bit more to try to remove it, get it out of the way, gross sounds. Um, okay, so now we can start to try to peel this off from now the corpus callosum. So I'm going to take the dorsal part, I'm going to pinch into the corpus callosum here just to sever it, and I'm going to start to peel the hippocampus away from the rest of it. I think I need to actually grip this and pinch it and peel it out a little bit more. So let me just make sure I'm not doing this incorrectly. There we go. So now we've peeled it back. And I think this about does it. I know, anticlimactic ending. Um, <laughs> But yeah, this is the entirety of the hippocampus with a little extra stuff still stuck on it. Uh, like the parahippocampal gyrus stuff, I could kind of just peel off the rest of that right here. Uh, uh, there we go. Something like that. But yeah, this is the hippocampus in its entirety, that C shape that I mentioned before. The dorsal parts up here, the ventral parts up here. And so, now you do it. <laughs>we weren't able to see were where it was pointing at thalamus and medial geniculate body. So the lateral geniculate nucleus would be sort of the outer mound of the whiter structure here. So if I'm going to pinch this, this is all like thalamus right here, this whole thing between my two fingernails. Thalamus is massive as it should be, as it makes sense to be. And when we look at it and peel it back, we see that that intermediate mass of the thalamus that we're trying to identify from the mid sagittal part we can follow it through now the exposed dorsal part of it that the hippocampus was wrapped around and then see it on the outer side too as a slightly whiter colored structure compared to the more beige surroundings. Okay.
actually see what's going on in here. So that let's... One does look a lot different. Yeah, so, so this one definitely got like contrast, compressed. I think that it was cleared out of blood, but that's not necessarily oh. something helpful. You can do that with these specimens, but let's yeah, try this one instead. Changes. Yeah, it's a little bit weird. Uh, we do have extras, so if this one is not helpful for you, I can swap it out with another one from the other room. Okay, so I made the cut. Just pull that apart there. It is anterior of the optic chiasm. And what we'll end up seeing is that there'll be sort of this interesting, almost three-way split. <coughs> so the two hemispheres will kind of come apart a little bit in the center here. Uh, yes, yeah, so I just drained out the lateral ventricles seen in here, those two little <coughs> crescent shapes up there. And we've talked about and seen the lateral ventricles in a few other contexts, but this will start to look a little bit uh, similar to what some anterior parts of the rat brain look like. Unfortunately for when we did the rat brain lab, we were lacking sections that were from this specific part of the brain. Uh, that said, I think this is around the location of where we're interested in. However, to take successive sections, try to aim for them being about a millimeter thick in each case. So I'm gonna do the same thing, like two millimeters. Okay, so then we got another cut here, and I'm just going to make sure that it's uh, not too far. Yep, this is where I want to be. Uh, there is, on this page, a line going here. You can bring down the camera to here. Uh, there's a little dot in the center where it says anterior commissure. And on this specimen, I can actually see it. It's a bit faint, but you can see the slightly light, lighter colored area here where my thumbnail is. And you can kind of just take a look closer as you go along. So I'll just point to it with a uh, tiny forceps right here. Very faint, lighter colored spot there, right in the middle. That is a fiber tract that is within the subcortical areas that connects the two hemispheres in the bottom. showcase this. I made cuts uh, sort of at these levels here, so we'll do, sorry, showcase this, and then this. Um, this. This one's an incomplete cut. We've got this inner surface here. Other side. Ours is giving very like yellowy, where this is like I don't know. Cool. So we're did a really good job designing Oh, I know that and let's take that off to expose this brainstem area. <laughs> All right. I figured in lieu of trying to show these in video, it would probably be better to show these in static images and then do some illustrations via Zoom's uh, annotations feature. So let's go ahead and do that now. First, we have our uh, beginning coronal section on our week two packet. This is going through parts of the basal ganglia, kind of in the basal forebrain area. And we're going to try to identify some structures in the following images. In each of these cases, I have multiple images that depict what we're seeing here. So that if you were given a live specimen, you kind of have some experience seeing some of the distinctions between different live specimens. So let's give it a go. Uh, firstly, we have a few different things to look at. Uh, one of them would be corpus callosum located here. 
Next to the corporate callosum, these large holes here are the lateral ventricles, the empty space within which cerebrospinal fluid resides. Next to these ventricles, we'll have the caudate nuclei. So that appears on both sides. Um, the caudate nucleus is something that we actually saw before. So shortly ago in the same video, there was uh, the part where we peeled aside the septum pellucidum and exposed the inside lateral ventricle. And then we were looking at a bulge on the inside of that. That bulge is this caudate here. So we were looking at it from the side inward. So kind of like from this direction here. Uh, and that allowed us to see inside the lateral ventricle from the side view. In this case, we're looking at it from the front on instead. Next up, we have the internal capsule, which is a white matter band that separates the caudate from a mixture of two other regions. We've got the putamen and the globus pallidus. For our cases, because they're hard to distinguish on a live specimen, the caudate, uh, sorry, the putamen and the globus pallidus, we can kind of clump together uh, interchangeably. In a more distinct specimen, like the one shown in this picture up here, we can see the difference in that the globus pallidus has a lot more spotting and a mottled look. And then the putamen would be something like this split off area next to it right here. There are other things that exist in this section as well that I think are worth pointing out. The anterior commissure, although it's a dot in both of these pictures, got this little thing here and this little thing here, it's actually a much larger band based on this cut being slightly more posterior than what's depicted in the diagrams here. So the anterior commissure is actually this white band right here. Um, beyond that, there are a bunch of other regions that I'm not requiring for the quiz. But if you are curious, uh, for instance, we have the septal nuclei being this middle part all through here. Um, and I think that's all I want to focus on for now. Body of the fornix will be a little bit harder to see until we get to a different part. And column of the fornix, I don't think is visible in this slab here. Now, to do a quick comparison uh, versus other similar sections, we got another one here. So here we could kind of zoom in and take a closer look. Here we do have some different features we can look at. First, we have again corpus callosum, lateral ventricles, caudate, internal capsule. You might be able to distinguish globus pallidus from putamen here. They're both collectively right over here. Uh, we do have what appears to be column of the fornix, the sort of uh, white dash mark kind of here, septonuclei, like I mentioned, are here. And I think that's about it for what I care about with this section here. So then we go to the next one. If we had a poor quality section, we could still make out some features. So this is one of the sections that came from a brain that was compressed during shipment, but we could still see some notable features. For instance, we can see the anterior commissure very faintly here. I believe the column of the fornix is this thing here that's sort of a different color. We definitely have caudate, lateral ventricle, uh, corpus callosum, septal nuclei, they're all in the same place that they should be. We have a new feature here. Uh, this is because, again, this section was a little bit more posterior than what's depicted here. This is the optic chiasm right here, the crossover of the optic nerves. It's a bit harder to see in this picture. Uh, the internal capsule will be approximately here, and then the putamen globus pallidus would be down here. Again, this is a trickier one to wrangle with, so it's okay if you have a lot of trouble looking at something like this. Uh, hopefully, you will have a better live specimen to look at later on. And again, we have another specimen where I don't think I'll draw in everything, but you should be able to kind of see the same features. Again, lateral ventricles very pronounced here, caudate very dark, internal capsule being lighter color, uh, putamen globus pallidus being around here anterior commissure, septonuclei, um, and that's about it.
this one was sort of squished down vertically, but at least the preservation of the structure is a little bit more distinct color wise. Now we have a few different images of this one as well. We're going to start with uh, the second set of images on our handout. So let's go ahead. Okay, not what I wanted. Stop. Let's go ahead and take a look at this one more closely. So we do see some similarities here. Um, some more pronounced areas that are easier to find. We'll start with those. First, corpus callosum, basically this connecting white area here. The lateral ventricles are just the open pockets that are on either side here. This whole white flap here, this is body of the fornix. The internal capsule, uh, which kind of merges into the cerebral peduncle, that is all throughout here. It's the whiter area throughout this part here. You'll notice that there are these more starkly white wedges that exist here. These are the optic tract. Uh, and so those exist on both sides there. We see them in the picture here. In the um, image that's higher up, we do see them connected. Where they connect in the middle, this would be the optic chiasm. So just to remind you, when we're going from the outside of the brain and then inward and posterior, we're starting with optic nerves coming out of the eyes. They meet and do the crossover at the optic chiasm, and then they uh, split back up and then go far into the brain as optic tracts, which we'll see in successive images as we go along. Other things to see here. This area right here would be the third ventricle, this hole, this slit here. Uh, that's not damage, that's an actual um, ventricle. In some cases, it may be split like it is in this diagram. We don't really need to worry about that. It, it may be split, it may not be, but this is the approximate location if you see some sort of holes there. In the rat brain, this part up here wouldn't count as lateral ventricles, but would be another part of the third ventricle. Uh, so in the rat brain exercises, you probably saw that there was a D3V and then a regular 3V. The third ventricle is actually split up by the intermediate mass of the thalamus, which is kind of like this whole chunk right here. And so it's mentioned here and it's indicated right here. So we saw that in previous things, uh, specifically the sagittal sections as IM, intermediate mass of the thalamus. Uh, for reference, this whole thing is thalamus that whole area there. So the thalamus is very large, and it's not just this one circular chunk here. To contrast with this, the hypothalamus is actually localized right underneath the thalamus, per the name. Uh, so the hypothalamus would be located pretty much around that area there. Now I want to get rid of that and a few other things because I want to be able to illustrate something that's a little bit faint on this one. You'll see these four dots that exist faintly on here, but a little bit more distinctly on here. We have column of the fornix, or I sometimes have called it fornix because that's the way it is in the rat brain alice. And then we have the mamillothalamic tract, or MT for short, if you will. And so we see that these surround the third ventricle as a sequence of four dots. They are right here, 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 and here. And so just so you can kind of see those, I'm going to remove these one by one. Okay. Is there anything else here? I think that those are the major areas that I wanted people to focus in on. Um, right. Okay, we do have some holdovers from before. These aren't things I'll ask you to identify in this section specifically, but we do have something like the putamen is more distinct here. It's mentioned over here. Um, what else? I think that's pretty much what I wanted to focus in on for this picture here. So let's go ahead and clear that and look at some other examples while we're at it. 
Here we got a difficult example, but we could still use it. There are still some features which are visible. So let's give it a go. First, corpus callosum, bam. Second, big white flap, body of the fornix. Lateral ventricles being on either side here and here. Um, third ventricle, again, more of a connected slit rather than split apart. The white matter dots that we just saw before, they're actually sticking out more like bulges here. We have the MT on both sides, and then the column of the fornix, or fornix for short, here and here. To make those visible again, I'll just remove the drawings. And then we have optic chiasm-ish would be about here, and then optic tract would be on either side here and here. The intermediate mass of the thalamus would just be in the center here, right above the third ventricle. On the right side, we can kind of see the internal capsule cerebral pedicle. It's kind of like this thing right here. It basically um, goes right next to where the um, optic tract would go. And those are the more identifiable parts here. Other things are a little bit harder to identify based on the poor quality of this section. Okay, so here we can move on to the next page. In this case, we have a few new players and a few returning players. Uh, let's go ahead and draw some. Corpus callosum basically is returning right here, as we'd figure. This is no longer the body of the fornix. It actually has become more convoluted and has become hippocampus. So we have hippocampus here, here. And additionally, it does make an appearance in lower parts. For instance, it does happen to be appearing right about here as a sliver. So we could kind of trace its pathway. Uh, you'll notice over here it says fimbra. This is connective tissue that helps to link the hippocampus subregions up a bit. So uh, kind of be the fimbra would be uh, places like right around up here and here. All right. Getting those out of the way, though. Other things that we have returning include the optic tract. It's actually pretty visible on this side. It is the stark white area right here. It has become much more of a sliver type thing. It is not down here anymore. These are very different structures that we'll get to in a moment. The third ventricle returns. This is again, not damaged, but this is the slit that is the third ventricle. In the picture, it also appears a little bit up here. So again, dorsal part of the third ventricle up there. We're not testing on it, but in this case, you can actually see the habenula as uh, colored distinct. That is this lighter colored area right there. So uh, continuing onward, one of the other things that I'd like you to look out for is the substantia nigra. So it's no denoted here, and it's a little bit thinner in the picture than it is on this section. The substantia nigra would be basically this uh, dark banded area over here. Below it would be the cerebral peduncle. So this lighter chunk here. Again, that is not the optic tract. That is now the cerebral peduncle over here. The optic tract, as we go further back in the brain, it'll become more like a sliver and then recede higher and higher and more laterally into the brain until it connects to where the lateral geniculate nucleus exists at some point here. The internal capsule still exists here, so we can kind of see this is a lighter colored area right about here. Now, in order to distinguish the substantia nigra from some of the surroundings, sometimes it'll stand out like this. Sometimes there are other features that can help us try to see it. If we go on the other side, we can actually see this light colored band that exists on the top of the substantia nigra here. And although I'm not testing on that specifically, it might be helpful to know that is the medial lemniscus. And so that's what this strip is right about here. All right. Mm, let's see. It's a bit torn off on this case, but we're kind of in the back of where the hypothalamus is, and we're now in the territory of where 
the mammillary body would be, and that would be on the basal area down here. I'm going to take that drawing away for a moment because we don't want to obscure some of the other things we have here. So let's go ahead and strip all that back. We can just barely see one of the fiber tracks here. We have uh, the fornix, which is this little one right here. And I'll take that away just so you can see it. And I do believe it's also right over here, though it is very hard to see. And let me make sure I'm not missing anything substantial. We already talked about lateral ventricles. They're still up here. Um, all right. Ah, lateral geniculate nucleus is starting to appear a little bit here. Uh, we may be able to see it to some degree. So I'm going to, again, strip back some of the drawings so we could see it a little bit more pronouncedly. Uh, we have the optic tract being right here. And then the lateral geniculate nucleus is next to it as this darker area right here. So LGN, lateral geniculate nucleus. Uh, that is the spot in which the optic tract eventually connects to and feeds visual information into the thalamus. The lateral geniculate nucleus is just a subregion of the thalamus. All right, so this was an easier to work with section compared to some other options. Let's do a more difficult one. This one is more difficult, mostly because the picture is a bit zoomed out. This might also correspond to something starting to look a little bit like the next section. So I would say that where this cut is, is between this one that we were just working with and this one that we'll start working with in a second. That said, let's try our best to work with this. We've got hippocampus here and also down here. They're being connected by the fimbra here. We've got top of the third ventricle here, uh, habenula up there. The bottom of the third ventricle, not really visible, but we kind of know it would be right about here-ish. We have a cerebral peduncle being roughly about there. Can't really make out substantia nigra in this prep. The mammillary body, we can kind of determine by it being this thing that's sticking out at the bottom here. Remember that when we were looking at the sagittal section, we actually saw a bulge sticking downward behind where the hypothalamus was. That's the mammillary body, and we see a cross-section of it right here. Looking further, I'm not sure that we could quite make out everything that we want to here. Uh, the optic tract would be roughly about um, here-ish. I'm not sure if this is it or if this is part of the hippocampus. Again, it's a blurry picture, so it's a bit hard to wrangle with. Uh, the LGN, I do think that we kind of see it here in this darker area. Let me uh, go ahead and undo that. I think that this darker area here is the LGN, and we can kind of presume that this would be the optic tract right there, the lighter colored area. Let me go ahead and remove those drawings for better visibility. And that is about it for what we can extract from this image here. Uh, so let's go ahead and move on and see what the next one looks like. OK. Now we can actually move to the next page. This is a lopsided cut, so this is going to have features of multiple pages. The left side is more anterior cut than the right side. Uh, so this will happen sometimes when sectioning brain tissue, whether it's sheep brain, rat brain, etc. One way that I can determine this is based on the shape of the subcortex. So keep in mind that we have cortex being this whole thing over here. We're going to lump in hippocampus with that because people sometimes say it's like neocortical or cortex related. The subcortex is then this thingy down here that the hippocampus eventually separates from. You'll notice that on this side, the hippocampus, sorry, the subcortex, including thalamus, has more of like almost a heart shape without the tip at the bottom. Whereas on this side, it's a little bit more like a bean or a kidney shape. Uh, so that's how I can figure out that this is more anterior based on the heart shape that we see in this picture compared to when I scroll down. Oh, 
Um, yeah, it kind of still resembles a little bit of the heart shape here. But if we take away the mammillary bodies, we'll actually see more of that kidney shape. And then we definitely see it a lot more here. So again, this being a lopsided cut makes it a little hard to pin exactly which page it's on. But a lot of the features that we're going to be highlighting here exist on multiple pages. So let's give it a go. We're going to just zoom in a touch, shrink this down a bit. OK. Next up, what we're going to do is, oh, let's go ahead and pull that diagram back up, move this over. OK. So taking a look at this, we have a new structure, this weird darkly colored thing here. This is the pineal gland. The corpus callosum in our case is no longer connected. So despite it being in the picture here, and it should be around here, it is not here. This tells me also that this is more posterior of a section because the corpus callosum no longer is connected to hemispheres. The hippocampus is prominently featured in these cases. So we have it all throughout here. And on this side, throughout here, roughly. The third ventricle, uh, which is starting to become the cerebral aqueduct, third ventricle connects with the cerebral aqueduct, or sometimes labeled on here, the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvius. That would be here-ish. Okay, let's go ahead and undo to set that back a bit. We'll go ahead and undo some of these other drawings here to remove some of the clutter. The optic tract now has receded a decent degree. It would basically be this lighter colored sliver on the exterior of this darker surface. The darker surface, um, the more lateral parts of it, would be the lateral geniculate nucleus. Other things that we could look at. There is another defining thing that I'm not testing on, but is helpful to notice. You probably saw this uh, sort of white arc here. This thing, that is what the posterior commissure is over here. Getting those out of the way though, what you should take greater notice of is how there's a darker colored region basically right in and around here. That is the central gray, also known as the periaqueductal gray matter, or, or PAG for short, P-A-G. So the periaqueductal gray matter um, surrounds the aqueduct. It does appear a little bit before the cerebral aqueduct, but still it is a very large brain region that we're going to see in the successive pages as we flip forward. All right. As for other things, substantia nigra, I feel, is usually a little bit too hard to pick out here, but it would be roughly around this area here. It is a bit hard to distinguish from, like, let's say, the cerebral peduncle. Uh, that would be roughly the lighter colored area right next to it there. Yeah, maybe you can actually see them a little bit better if I do something like this. And then cerebral peduncles, this. The mammillary bodies are no longer connected here, so they would exist right here. And I think that's about it for things that we could actually pick out from here. The rest is a little bit too distinct or not really um, something I'm caring about trying to examine closely. Let's take a look at the next page. This has the same lopsided cut issue. It is a different brain, though. And it is a little bit trickier in some ways, a little bit easier based on it being a high resolution picture and better lighting. So let's see what we can do with it. First, hippocampus, this whole chunk of stuff right here, lots of hippocampus on this side in particular. So keep in mind the hippocampus as we sectioned it, sorry, as we removed it, uh, when we did the um, hippocampal removal from the first week of our sheep brain lab, we saw that it was a C shape. As we've been cutting deeper and deeper into the brain tissue, we were first cutting the top of the C, 
um, here would be an example of the top of the C only. But eventually, we're going to start cutting into the backbone of the C. And that's what this part is here, the backbone. And then the bottom of the C starts to show up a little bit here, but did show up in some earlier images over on this side. So again, we could tell that this is a more anterior uh, cut on this side. This is the more posterior one where we're finally getting into the backbone of the C, it being a lopsided cut between left and right. Corpus callosum is connected here, so we see that right here. Pineal gland, very obvious right here in the middle. Cerebral aqueduct slash third ventricle, basically this hole right here. The uh, posterior commissure, again, optional area, but pronounced compared to the surroundings right there. The central gray, aka PAG, is basically right about there. The optic tract, I can't really make out here on the left. Um, maybe I could make it out a little bit on the right. It would be a very small sliver. You can basically guarantee that next to it, though, would be the lateral geniculate nucleus. And so we'd have something similar on the side where it would be a sliver. And then LGN would take up this portion of the thalamus here. Substantia nigra and cerebral peduncle are not particularly visible here. Substantia nigra would be basically about here. Cerebral peduncle would be about here. But we can't really visually distinguish them based on this being sort of a sawed cut. You can tell based on the, the ribbing that the tissue has here versus this side is a much cleaner cut. And that is it for this image. Let's take a look at the next one. Ah. So again, we have another example. The top is actually the uh, section that we were just looking at. The bottom is where the cut is less lopsided. So the two sides are a little bit more equal. And so we have something that may resemble the picture a little bit better in this case. So we can do the, this one more time. We have again, cerebral aqueduct right here. We have posterior commissure, optional area. Pineal gland, very dark here. Hippocampus, very pronounced, right here. And same on the other side. Corpus callosum would be approximately right here. Um, can't really see optic tract so well. Let's take a closer look. Yeah, optic tract might be this lighter colored part right here. LGN would be right next door to it right there. You cannot distinguish cerebral peduncle from substantia nigra, but based on prior examples, you know where approximately they should be. And that might be it for what we can actually distinguish here. Okay. So we're not going to bother with the top part quite as much in this case. We've kind of already established that as this previous page. We're going to go ahead and skip down to the next diagram because that better matches this page down here, or this uh, section down here. We now have the back of the backbone of the hippocampus. So let's go ahead and draw that a bit. We can see it sticking out here. Same thing on the other side. Pineal gland is bulging out here. Cerebral aqueduct now is here. Posterior commissure. Um, there's still a little bit of it there. It's a bit faint. The um, central gray or PAG, we can kind of see it if we look closely. So let me go ahead and zoom this in a bit. Yeah, the central gray matter would be roughly about this here. Sort of like an upside down droplet of sorts. We do see these spots. Uh, this is another optional area that I didn't mention in lab, but we can actually see here in this image. Red nucleus. The darker spots correspond to the red nucleus here. We can actually also see the brachium or brachium 
of the inferior colliculus. Again, another optional area, but darker spot on this image. In this case, the lateral geniculate nucleus and the optic tract have pretty much gone away. What they're going to be replaced by is that this upper layer here is the superior colliculus, another vision-related area. And it'll get larger in the successive sections, or well, one of the next sections. And I don't think I can really see cerebral peduncle down here. Substantia nigra would be approximately here, but it's a bit hard to distinguish from the surroundings. Um, right. Yeah, I think that's about it. We also see that the hemispheres aren't quite connected. There isn't a connecting corpus callosum that would exist somewhere in here. It does not. All right. I think that's about it for what we can see in this section. So let's go ahead and look to the next image. OK. So here, this matches this picture a little bit better, but the image is a little blurrier. And we're going to try again with this one as well. So let's go ahead and zoom in. Let's see here. Actually, these might correspond to the final part. So let's go ahead to the final image. Yeah, this matches a little better with the final images here. So our sixth uh, pair of images, we see first uh, staining that exemplifies the gray matter, keeping the white matter white. And we see down here, it says lateral ventricle. And what you kind of see here is that there is a gap here. That is the lateral ventricle. Keep in mind that the lateral ventricle is surrounding the hippocampus. So once we remove the backbone of the hippocampus, that exposes the groove in which the lateral ventricle existed. Ventricles are gaps in this case, since there are no longer fluid-filled pockets once the brain has been drained of excess fluid. In this case, the hippocampus is still partly wedged in here, but if we were to remove it, that would be the wall of the lateral ventricle, which we see kind of peeking out behind it up here. Cerebral aqueduct, as before. You can see the periaqueductal gray matter kind of throughout here a decent degree. It's much larger. You can kind of make out the superior colliculus. It is a larger band, so it's like this area right throughout here. Uh, it'll be definitely more pronounced if you were looking at it from the outside rather than through this cross section kind of view. It's a bit hard to see some of the other structures like bra brachium of the inferior colliculus. We can't really see that dark dot there. Um, red nuclei, I'm not confident in trying to visualize them here and other such things. So at this point, we can kind of jump to the next image that we want to play around with. This one, we have some features that are more pronounced, some features that are less pronounced. We can see that the cerebral cortex hemispheres, we're now looking at the back of the cerebral hemispheres, and they are basically separating off the brainstem uh, as they are in the picture here. So they are not like they're not held on by anything once we section the brain this way. You'll also notice there's this sort of bulge here. That's the last piece of the hippocampus. We kind of see the cavity in which the lateral ventricle exists and back piece of the hippocampus. This one's flipped upside down, if people are wondering. Definitely a large uh, cerebral aqueduct in the middle there. Superior colliculus, we can kind of see a little bit better now as distinct from the surrounding areas, like so. We can maybe see the brachium of the inferior colliculus being this darker area around here. And we do see these darker spots here, which are probably the uh, red nuclei that are being that are still a holdover from the previous image. So those would be these spots here, I believe. 
And again, substantia nigra is a bit hard to try to visualize. It would be down in the bottom, cerebral pinochle kind of has the same issue here. So we're not going to worry about trying to see those. Now, this is an incredibly hard one to work with, but we do see, again, some of the same features. Um, we have back part of the hippocampus remaining. This section is so far back that we don't even have the back wall of the lateral ventricle where it should be here, but it's not. Cerebral aqueduct. Gray matter surrounds it. You can almost make out the outline of it as I trace it here. Superior colliculus, oh, redo that one. Superior colliculus is roughly throughout here. And the rest of the features are kind of indistinct, save for, again, those nuclei that are optional, the red nuclei I've mentioned previously. Clear all. I think we have one more, or is that it? Yes, that's it for the images. OK. So that covers the main stuff that I wanted people to focus on for the coronal sections. The rest is in the videos. Any other things that are labeled on these diagrams that I did not mention here, uh, those are, again, optional. And in some cases, I mentioned specific things that were optional as well. Uh, so don't worry about being tested on those specifically during the quiz. Uh, anything else that seemed more important that I specifically emphasize here definitely is fair game for our practicum quiz.